All right, so I really appreciate everybody um, taking the time to attend the webinar. As you can see, there's 276 people that are have already joined and um, the additional people are, are, are still connecting. We had over 500 people signed up for the webinar. So I really wanna thank everybody for joining. If you're in early, that's great because once we hit 500, there's a limit and some people who might wanna attend won't be able to get in. So there's a variety of people on the call. There are retailers, veterinarians, uh, other people. We had a number of regulators um, also join, and I want to thank them for participating as well. Uh, first thing I want to do is introduce our team. And also, this presentation is specifically directed at the new changes for food supplements. As we are the National Animal Supplement Council, we're going to focus on supplements. However, the pet food labeling modernization uh, initiatives apply to all pet food, uh, including specialty pets, as you'll hear in the presentation. So uh, people can ask questions during the webinar. Um, you can type your question in the in the Q&A box, and we'll have time at the end and try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, I want to cover the agenda briefly and also introduce each team member. Ryan, I don't see the uh, presentation on my screen. Okay, got it. Okay, so the agenda that we're going to cover today will be on the second slide. And I also want to introduce the people who will cover these particular topics. So most of the people here on the NANC team, I think you probably know or have had uh, interactions with. So Jennifer Gornett, Gornett is going to give a brief background and also cover key labeling changes and the intended use statement. Miriam Johnson uh, is going to cover the nutrition facts box. Uh, Katie Brenner gets uh, two sections, the feeding directions as well as handling and storage. And then uh, Ryan is going to talk about implementation, uh, timing, time frames, things like that. And then we're going to have some resources that Ryan will cover, and he'll, he'll also be the moderator for Q&A. We're also going to shut our video cameras off during the you know, presentation. So as soon as I get done here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut my camera down just so we don't run into any bandwidth issues because we have so many people that are presenting we don't want to have audio audio issues so again thanks everybody for attending uh we're at the very start and again we're still climbing in terms of people joining we're at 311 and again we had over 500 people so thanks a lot for attending i'll turn it over to the team thank you bill and welcome everyone wow 500 of you who knew so many people were interested in correctly labeling food supplements? <laughs> That's great. Well, we are so excited that all of you could join us today. Thank you for being here. Knowing that we have such a large, diverse audience today, we thought we would start by explaining what is AFCO and NAC's role with PFLM. So AFCO stands for the Association of American Feed Control Officials, which is a nonprofit association made of local, state, federal, and international agencies. While AFCO is non-regulatory, its members have the authority to regulate the sale and distribution of animal feed and pet food, including food supplements in the United States. One very significant role that AFCO plays is to develop model regulations. The model regulations serve kind of like a template most states adopt the model regulations as their own state fee law and regulations. This process is in place for the purpose of having consistent requirements from state to state. So what is NAC's role with AFCO and the Pet Food Modernization Label Project? Changes made to the pet food model regulations affect NASC members who market food supplements. Consequently, being an active partner with AFCO is essential. Currently, Bill Bookout and myself serve on the AFCO Pet Food Committee and have been engaged with the PFLM project. In fact, Bill and I presented at the AFCO recent PFLM training that was held for industry and regulators last month. As a leading expert on animal supplements, it is critical that the NESC team provides accurate, helpful guidance to our members. Today's webinar and the variety of guidance documents that you can check out on our website are examples of how NASC provides ongoing support to our members. 
Next, a little background on how we got here. This change is going to require a lot of work for both industry and regulators and even us. So why did AFCO decide to change the pet food label? It came from the consumer. Consumers are concerned about what they purchase for their pets. When surveyed, they ask for labels that are easier to understand so they may make an informed purchase decision. In response, beginning in 2015, AFCO initiated the Pet Food Label Modernization Project to update regulations for pet food labeling and to create a label format that is easy to understand. One goal of the new labeling requirements was to more closely align pet food labels with human food labeling, something they were familiar with, and to require consistent placement of specific information so you always knew where to go, where to look for that information. To make sure we are all on the same page, I would like to note a few things before we dive in. PFLM applies to all pet and especially pet foods, including complete food, treats, food mixers, food supplements, and veterinary diets. To be clear, NASC only works with animal supplements, specifically food supplements and health supplements. So two key terms to note in that first statement, pet and food supplements. AFCO defines pet as dog and cat. NA NASC members may market food supplements for dogs, cats, and horses. So please note, these changes do not apply to horse feed products, including horse supplements. AFCO defines food supplement to mean food products for pets or specialty pets that are intended to supply a specific nutrient or nutrients. It is not intended to be a complete diet. So for the purpose of this training, our focus is on how the changes affect labeling food supplements for dogs and cats. Okay, before I start to explain the first regulation, I mentioned earlier that AFCO develops the model regulations. Um, again, we have a diverse group here today and I just wanna be clear on what I mean when I refer to the model regulations. In order for you to review the model regulations, you'll need access to the AFCO official publication, which we commonly refer to as the OP. In the OP, you will find two sets of model regulations. One pertains to commercial livestock feed and the other to pet food. You'll notice in the pet food regulations, there is a PF in front of each regulation. The regulation noted on this slide, PF4, indicates that this regulation is number four of the pet food regulations. Throughout the webinar, we will note the specific regulation if you have any questions or need to learn more about a specific regulation, note the number to help you find that regulation in the AFCO OP. Okay, so the first one we're gonna talk about is model regulation PF4, and it's two parts. So we're gonna start with the first part, which is the intended use statement. So this is a new requirement. The intended use statement must include two parts, the intended species, and the intended nutritional purpose of the food. So before you were required to include the species, but now you must also include the nutritional purpose. Also before you could state the species anywhere on the principal display panel, but now the intended use statement is required to be placed on the lower third of the front panel. You can see in that image with the arrow pointing down of an example. I also just wanna clarify something that came up at the AFCO training. The intended use statement is in addition to all the other information that you're currently including on your principal display panel. So the regulations regarding product and brand name, quantity statement, your marketing claims, all of that remains the same. This is just an additional requirement regarding your front panel. So why the new requirement? Well, you probably know from your own experience shopping, when a consumer reviews pet food products, they typically begin by reading the front panel. By requiring the intended use statement to be on the front, 
it clearly informs the consumer to the proper use of the product by specifying the intended species and the intended purpose. When you review PF4, you're going to see a list of options. Depending on the purpose of the pet product, the new regulation requires one of the following eight intended use statements. Each of the eight intended use statements has its own definition. You will need to pick one. You will note each option does include the intended species and the intended nutritional purpose. So for our NASC members, number six, that's going to be your option. Again, all animal supplements intended to provide supplemental nutrients are considered food supplements and must include the intended use statement, the species, food supplement, verbatim which means you really have three options. You can state dog food supplement, cat food supplement, or dog and cat food supplement. Part of the regulation goes into some formatting details, and we're just gonna highlight some of the key parts to the regulation. As I mentioned earlier, the intended use statement must be placed on the bottom third of the principal display panel. And the net quantity statement is going to be your point of reference for formatting. So in relation to the net quantity statement, the intended use statement must be equal to or greater than the type height, appear in the same color and style, meaning if your net quantity statement is bold, so must the intended use statement, and it must be on the same background color. Essentially, your intended use statement must be distinct and separate from all um, other information and be very easy for the consumer to find. The other piece to regulation four is including the nutritional adequacy claim on the front panel. The nutritional adequacy claim refers to the nutrient content of the pet food as relates to the life stage of the animal. For example, is your product intended for an adult dog or a puppy or perhaps kittens? The nutritional adequacy claim only applies to complete diets. Food supplements are not intended to be a complete diet. That's not part of the definition. Therefore, the nutritional adequacy claim does not apply. We're only mentioning this because when you review this regulation, you're going to see it and we don't want you to be taken off guard, but it does not apply to food supplements. However, not to be confusing, we still have the nutritional adequacy statement, right? You're all familiar with this. Currently, you do not need to include this if you were clear and stated supplement on the front of your label. Well, now you must include it and it must be located at the bottom of the new pet nutrition facts box. So again, the nutritional adequacy statement this product is intended for intermittent or supplemental feeding only, must be consistently located in the pet nutrition facts box of all pet food supplements. So up next, Miriam's going to cover the pet nutrition facts box. Thank you, Jennifer. And now we're gonna dive into probably the most notable change to the pet food regulations, the pet nutrition facts box. You'll find the model regulations that pertain to the facts box in PF5. Okay. So we're gonna visually show you the change in the next couple of slides so that you can see the difference in where we are currently and then where we're headed. But before we do that, let's review some background information. As Jennifer previously mentioned, Consumers expressed they wanted to have a better understanding of the information provided on pet food labels, and the guaranteed analysis was hard to understand and relate to the, nutri the nutrient content. So in designing pet food labels to look more like human food labels, the concept of the pet nutrition facts box was born. And because animals have different nutrition requirements, certain information also needed to remain the same. While the nutrition facts box is providing nutrient information 
in a consistent, relatable format and location, which is new. The things that have not changed are a guarantee of nutrients will still be provided. The minimum moisture guarantee has always been required for pet food products, and that's going to remain the same. The nutrient guarantees will still be listed in the same order as provided in the AFCO nutrient profiles for dogs and cats. An asterisk will still denote non-essential nutrients, which are any nutrients not listed in these nutrient profiles. And when required, an explanation of enzyme activity will continue to follow the non-essential nutrient disclaimer. And then lastly, calorie content and nutritional adequacy statements will still need to be stated on the label. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of why there was this change and keeping in mind what's going to remain the same, well, let's talk about the change itself. And again, we're going to show you in the next slide what that's going to actually look like. So moving forward within the facts box, the total calories will be stated. And in addition to those total calories, an individual breakdown of calories provided by protein, fat, and carbohydrates will also be included. The nutrients are now stated in common household measurements or other easily defined amounts, which are more relatable to the consumer. Crude fiber has now been replaced with better measurements of fiber content, and those will now be total carbohydrates and dietary fiber. The nutritional adequacy statement will now be consistently in the same location on the label at the bottom of the nutrition facts. And then lastly, and one of the bigger changes to absorb, nutrient quantities have always been guaranteed in percentages. The new requirements involve listing the amount of each nutrient per the appropriate unit of measure. So whether that's a gram, a milligram, an IU, a CFU, um, et cetera, all of those different types of units that you can, you can guarantee your nutrients. And so I hope this is beginning to show us all where the addition of the nutrient facts box is leading um, and, and providing a place for consumers to find everything in one spot. Okay. So we've been saying we want to show you what that looks like visually. And to do that, um, let's look at the original label format on the left of the screen and compare it to the new label format on the right of the screen. With the original label formatting, a guaranteed analysis is listed with the calorie content and the nutritional adequacy statements falling directly underneath. But with the new label formatting, the guaranteed analysis heading will now state pet nutrition facts. The guaranteed analysis components will still be listed, but with this new formatting shown here, the calorie content will still be listed, but now within the nutrition facts box, and also now with those familiar household units I mentioned, and the total content further broken down into calories from protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And then lastly, a nutritional adequacy statement is still a requirement, but now it will be placed in the facts box itself. So the overall components have not changed, but the formatting and presentation of the components will now look different. And then again, reiterating in one location for customers to easily locate the information. All right, so now that we've seen that visual uh, representation of the change, Let's break down all the pieces that are required to be included within this nutrition facts box. And we've tried to simplify that here into six main sections. So number one will be the header to the facts box. And the statement pet nutrition facts must be centered in the top row of the box and twice the size of all other text in the box leaving all the other text within the box being the same size and style, but half the size of the header itself. Um, this information must be in a box and it must be all black or one color type and clearly visible under the heading on a white or neutral contrasting background. And this just ensures it's clearly visible for a consumer to be able to view and read and find on the label. Number two is the product unit section. You'll state the unit and its weight in grams, as you can see here in this example. 
So when we talk about the unit, we're talking about the unit that's consistent with the unit used in feeding directions. So soft chew, scoop, teaspoon, piece. And then our example here just shows specifically one soft chew equaling eight grams. All right. And then number three is the calorie section. So the total calories must be stated in the same unit consistent with the feeding directions. And I think we can all see a pattern here. Um, and then listed below the total content will be the calories from protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Now you might ask, what if the breakdown of protein, fat, and carbs is zero? And in the past, the answer to that question is not to include the guarantee or the information related to that particular analyte. So the guidance now provided by AFCO is to include zero for each of those values versus not including the information at all. Um, so to help with calculating this information, AFCO is developing a calculator to be available for companies to use to help determine these values. And once that's available, uh, we will let our members know and, and where you can find that so you can use it in the future. Number four is the nutrient section, which was formerly called the guaranteed analysis. Um, it will now be broken into two sections. And on the left, the header for the nutrient content, nutrients, is to be left justified. Under this header, you will list all the nutrients that the supplement is intended to or claims to provide. Moisture is a maximum guarantee as it has been in the past and is always required. Um, if the amount of ash is provided, it will be listed after the guarantee for moisture. And then you'll list the guarantees for essential nutrients as per the AVCO dog or cat food nutrient profiles. Um, and these will follow moisture or ash, just depending on how that's listed. And then lastly, the guarantees for substances not listed in the AVCO dog or cat nutrient profiles, the non-essential nutrients, these will follow the listing of essential nutrients. And then these non-essential nutrient guarantees have to be accompanied by the asterisks as they have in the past. And we'll further discuss in a minute in the footnote section of the facts box, the statement that's required in addition to the asterisks. Um, for the required order of nutrient guarantees, the nutrient profiles are provided in the AFCO official publication. And then for our NASC members, you can also refer to our guidance document 1.32.4 guarantees for pet food supplements. And then lastly, on the right of the breakout of the on the right of this breakout, the header per the unit is to be right justified and the unit again consistent with the feeding directions. Our example here shows soft chew. You will include the numerical amount of each nutrient below this header using the appropriate standard unit of measurement. Um, so this is where uh, percentage was once the measurement, and now you'll use grams, milligrams, IUs, CFUs, whichever is appropriate to quantify the nutrient. And you can see that displayed here in our example. Okay. And then number five is the footnote section. This section has been included to capture required statements for nutrient content and now provides one location for those statements to be found. It's separated from the nutrient guarantees by a bold line. And the first footnote disclaimer that we want to talk about, you'll note the dagger symbol shown with the total calories at the top of the box. And then you'll notice the dagger symbol used in the footnote section. You'll want to use this symbol as shown in this example to denote to the consumer the total calorie content is calculated. And the footnote disclaimer calculated value must appear immediately after the last guarantee under the bold line. The second footnote statement that we want to mention is the is required, and if it's required, is the non-essential nutrient disclaimer. That statement is not recognized as an essential nutrient by the AFCO dog or cat food nutrient profiles. And it must appear immediately after the calculated value footnote using the asterisk as in the past that has not changed um, other than consistency in location. And same as before when required, an explanation of enzyme activity units should follow the non-essential nutrient disclaimer. 
They will just now be included within the footnotes section of the nutrition facts box. Okay, and then lastly, the nutritional adequacy statement section. This section is separated from the footnotes section by a bold line. The required nutritional adequacy statement for animal food supplements is, this product is intended for intermittent or supplemental feeding only. And since NASC members are only concerned with animal supplements, this will be verbatim across the board for all of our members who market animal food supplements. So we, NASC, um, we do have an available guidance document, 1.40.1, Pet Nutrition Facts Box, um, that's available to use to help navigate this new section of the animal food supplement labeling. You can, of course, reach out to all of us here on the compliance team with any questions, but we wanted to let you know this is available and out there on the member website and helps describe everything we've talked about today related to the Pet Nutrition Facts Box. And with all of that said, I will now turn it over to Katie to talk about ingredient statement updates. Thank you, Miriam. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Model regulation PF6 covers ingredient statements. This should be a fairly simple task to put your list of ingredients on your label, but it can sometimes be challenging as there are several areas which have been open to interpretation or subject to enforcement discretion, which causes confusion. So the PFLM includes some updates to PF6 to provide some clarity. The first update is regarding vitamin and mineral premixes. Now, we all know, or I hope we all know, that ingredients are required to be listed in descending order of predominance. And this applies to vitamins and minerals, and those ingredients need to be broken out and put in their proper place in descending order. I can speak from previous experience in past life that this is a challenging task sometimes. So over the years, some states have started using enforcement discretion to allow the vitamin and mineral premix itself to be listed in descending order rather than breaking those components out. It's been a little inconsistent, I guess, and has caused some confusion. So PF6A2 puts in writing that this is now an allowable practice. You can list vitamins with their parenthetical statement <clears throat> of the components in that vitamin premix, and the same applies to minerals. Another addition, which is not new specifically this year, but relatively new in the last couple of years, is the addition of Table 90.27, which covers um, a list of consumer recognized names that are acceptable to use in ingredient statements, provided that the source ingredient is listed parenthetically. So, for example, vitamin A acetate, which many consumers might not really recognize or understand what it is, can be listed as vitamin A with vitamin A acetate parenthetical. So keep in mind that that's available to you in the vitamin section of chapter six in the OP. The next update that was provided is for common or usual names. Now common foods are defined in part as food items commercially available and suitable for use in animal food, but are not defined by AFCO. You can imagine that that is open to a lot of interpretation. So, <clears throat> The Common Food Index was created and is available out on the AFCO website to provide some guardrails for what constitutes a common food. This is um, things that you, know, you might find in a grocery store that many people feed to their animals, but it's not an AFCO defined ingredient. So make sure that you reference the Common Food Index to see if your proposed ingredient in your formula is on that list. Uh, there's also an option or to provide a uh, submit a request if you have if there's an ingredient that you want to use that's not on that common food index and, and is also not a defined ingredient that common food list is going to probably evolve over time so feel free to submit a request to have an ingredient added to the list it might not be honored keep that in mind but su submitting requests is an option and that is also available on the website Third up is ingredients with a standard of identity. This puts in writing PF6A4 that if you're using an ingredient in your formula that has a standard of identity under USDA or FDA, uh, that ingredient must be listed with the parenthetical listing of the ingredients that make up that ingredient, such as peanut butter. Most peanut butters have salt, palm oil, um, 
maybe a spice like cinnamon or something. So if you're using peanut butter, you need to also include the parenthetical statement. Cheese is another example that's a commonly used ingredient in pet food, as is yogurt sometimes. So make sure that whatever ingredient you're using, you're checking to see if there's a standard of identity for that and listing it appropriately in, in your ingredient statement. Next up, we have the naming of fish ingredients. There's a few options for how to, how to list your fish ingredient in your ingredient statement. You can simply say fish. That covers a wide range of species, obviously. You're not required to necessarily list the species. Fish is perfectly acceptable. You can also use a descriptive name, which might apply to multiple species, again, without having to list those species out. So ocean whitefish is a great example of that. Ocean whitefish can cover anything from pollock to cod to flounder to halibut and you don't need to declare which of those it is, you can simply say ocean whitefish. Or you can refer to the FDA seafood, seafood list, which a quick Google search will take you to. Um, and you can list your fish by the acceptable market or common name that's established by that seafood list. Alaska cod is an acceptable market name, so you can list it that way. Pink salmon, you can list, which is a common name for one of the five Pacific salmon species. Tuna is another good example where tuna is a market name on the seafood list, but you can also name albacore or skipjack tuna or bluefin tuna, which are common names associated with that market name. So just keep in mind there's, there's several options for naming your fish. Next up, we have sugar. This has been a little bit confusing in the past because sugar is, is not an AFCO defined ingredient. So states have used enforcement discretion to allow it. And now we have PF 6A7, which puts in writing that sugar is an acceptable term to be used in an ingredient statement. But bear in mind, there's a caveat. Sugar can only be used in reference to sucrose, which is obtained from sugar or sugar beets. So if you're using sucrose from honey, you would have to make sure that honey is either a, an approved ingredient or on the common food index, which is now available that we just talked about um, a few slides ago. And it is actually on the common food index. So just to reiterate, you can now use sugar, but make sure that that sugar is obtained from sugar beets or sugar cane. And finally, we have organic. I think, again, there's been a little bit of confusion with the term organic and whether it constitutes a quality or grade claim and whether it's allowed to be used in an ingredient statement. So PF6D puts in writing that it does not constitute a quality or grade claim, and it is an allowable descriptor for an ingredient. But again, there's a caveat. Make sure that your ingredient <clears throat> meets the requirements in the National Organic Program. So there are several things that have not changed in the ingredient statement, and I want to make sure we cover those before we move on. Your ingredients are still required to be listed in a consistent format. So same style, size, color of all of the ingredients. You can't make one bold purple to highlight it. Ingredients are also still required to be listed in descending order of predominance by weight. Your ingredients must be listed by their AFCO defined name exactly as it's written in chapter six of the OP. And another point that I wanna make sure to make clear with your ingredient names is it's not only enough to make sure that your ingredient is listed as it's named in the OP, but your ingredient also needs to meet the definition that's written below that name. So those two don't go very closely hand in hand and, and they need to match. Brand or trade names are still not allowed to be used in ingredient statements, nor are quality or grade claims allowed to be used in ingredient statements. So if you're using prime beef, you can make that claim outside of your ingredient statement as a marketing claim, but the ingredient itself needs to be listed as beef. Same as wild Alaskan salmon oil. We see this a lot when we're reviewing labels. You can make a claim elsewhere on your label that you're using wild Alaskan salmon oil, but the ingredient statement simply needs to say salmon oil. So that's everything about ingredients right now. Next, we'll cover model regulation PF8, which covers feeding directions. These were updated a little bit to, again, provide some more clarity in what's required, especially for food supplements, which has been a little bit gray in the past. 
So when you're making your feeding directions for your food supplements, make sure that you are including both the quantity of, of the product that's being administered to the animal per weight of animal. Those two things now have to go hand in hand. So you can either do a weight chart, which is very common, one to 20 pounds, one soft chew, 21 to 40 pounds, two soft chews, et cetera. Or you can make a sentence, one soft chew per 20 pounds of of animal weight and your customer will know, you know, to do the math if they have a larger or smaller animal. The frequency of feeding is also a requirement now. So you must identify whether you're it's a once a day, twice a day, once a week of frequency. That needs to be very clear on your label. And finally, Miriam talked about this, but I want to make sure to reiterate the unit used in your feeding directions must be consistent with the unit used in the nutrition facts box. So if you're saying um, one soft chew is eight grams using Miriam's example, then you must identify that the soft chew is what's being administered to the animal. So make sure you're consistent there. And finally, we have model regulation PF12, which is covering handling and storage instructions. This is a new regulation this year, so bear that in mind. And also bear in mind that these are optional. It is not a requirement to include handling and storage instructions, but PF12 is here to identify the requirements that are you need to follow if you choose to include handling and storage instructions. So make sure you, you read those clearly. This, it, the high points are you need to use a heading and it needs to be verbatim handling and storage instructions and it needs to be bold so it's prominent. It is a different section from other areas of required labeling so it needs to be a separate and distinct, especially from feeding directions but also from other labeling requirements. You need to make sure that your instructions are easily read and easily understood by your consumer. And if a graphic is used, as you can see in, on this slide, there's lots of options of graphics. You need to make sure that you are using the AFCO approved graphics and the accompanying text, both. Uh, you can't just use one of the pictures. You need to use both the text and the picture. And these graphics are available on the AFCO website. They've made it very easy to go in and download them so you can apply them to your labels if you choose to do that. That concludes my piece. I'd like to hand it over to Ryan now to talk about implementation and next steps. Thank you, Katie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation and kind of what that timetable looks like. Now, do you understand that each state has its own process and how these regulations may be adopted within their own state? Now, AFCO is recommending each state exercise regulatory discretion for six years. That discretionary period will be reassessed at the AFCO annual meetings based on, based on state and industry progress. So it is possible that that will be extended or even slightly reduced, but don't worry, you're going to have plenty of time to make that transition and make those changes. Now, most states are going to exercise regulatory discretion, but some states may not follow that approach. Ultimately, it's going to be up to you, the company, to determine when to implement those changes. However, until NESC can determine, all states are exercising regulatory discretion, and we are going to determine that in relatively short order, as well as update our members. We are recommending that members delay implementing those changes. Now, what are some kind of just next steps and important things to consider? Well, one, familiarize yourself with the new requirements right away. The better you understand it, the easier the transition and the less problems you're going to have. Determine when it makes sense for you to implement. Uh, purchase that new 2024 AFCO official publication. The new changes are in there. So if you have anything older, it's not going to have those changes. So you're going to want to get that and be familiar with, with, with the, the new uh, updates. AFCO website has all the PFLM updates on it. That's, you know, visit the AFCO website. Do keep in mind that once you start the transition, you cannot use both the old and new requirements on the same label. It's got to be one or the other, because otherwise, if you go to register, you're going to cause yourself a lot of problems. Now, for our retail and veterinarian partners, hopefully you found this presentation useful and hopefully things make more sense. But if it doesn't, don't worry. AFCO will have some educational resources specifically for you on those label changes. 
Uh, and then lastly, at the Global Pet Expo, they are going to do presentations on the PFL, PFLM update as well as some other AFCO initiatives. So if you're going, take advantage of that. Now, here's just some resources. Both AFCO as well as NESC are going to have a lot of updates on this. On the AFCO side, you can go to afco.org forward slash PFLM. Uh, to get all those updated uh, updates and all those all that uh, educational resources and materials, uh, the 2024 AFCO official publication. Again, you want to purchase that. The pet and specialty pet food labeling guidelines always a great idea. And then, of course, AFCO is going to have a pretty extensive ongoing and education and outreach program for these updates. On the NESC side, um, you know, lots of updates there. Labeling webpage section for members will have a lot of those updated guidance documents. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk a lot about this at the annual conference. And then, of course, you can email us directly at compliance at nasc.cc. So, if you have any questions along the way whether it's a retailer or a veterinarian or even a member, feel free to email us at compliance at nesc.cc. All right, so lastly, we're gonna get into questions, but just a, com a couple of comments before we get into questions. So these slides, I believe Jenny uh, added them to the chat so you can get them there as well as on our website. We will be uploading these to the website on the public version. Uh, our annual conference is coming up, so please don't forget to register. And for anybody that attended this webinar, you can register as a member. So you don't have to register as a non-member. You can register as a member and get that, 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 that discount. Um, as far as questions, we'll read off some of these questions. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, but if any questions come along the way outside of this webinar, again, you can email us at compliance at nesc.cc. All right, so we'll go ahead and read off some of these questions here. It looks like we only have two questions. Hey, Ryan, hey, Ryan yeah. before we do that, uh, go ahead. if I could just jump in. I, and, sure. you know, if you have questions, type them in. And, you know, we have 15 minutes for questions. So anyway, I, I really want to thank the NESC team for putting this together. They really worked hard on the presentations. And I just want to say thank you for putting on, I think, a great webinar. This is not intended to be a deep dive into PFLM. You know, we always say, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? This webinar is intended to be an introduction, not a deep dive. As Ryan said, there's gonna be other educational programs that both NASC as well as AFCO is, uh, has on the agenda. Global Pet Expo, Austin Terrell is gonna be there. Um, who's the executive director of AFCO. There'll be seminars there, and it'll also include Common Food Index presentation. So if you're at Global, do that. One of the questions came back, will there be anything at SuperZoo? AFCO does have uh, education and outreach and also the Pet Food Committee and is considering other conferences to attend. SuperZoo is on that list. I don't think it's been finalized yet, but um, you know, keep your eye on the AFCO website because they'll make announcements of, of additional educational opportunities as well as, you know, additional opportunities. When we had the PFLM training prior to the AFCO meeting in January, that was a half day session. So again, this is intended to be, this webinar is intended to be an introduction, not a deep dive. Um, several people ask questions about dosage form products that are not nutritionally intended. They are health supplements. They are not food, they are not nutritional supplements. So BFLM does not apply to dosage form products that are not intended to be nutritionally beneficial. Um, unapproved ingredients, different section, none of this applies there. So anyway, that's all I have to say. I really appreciate again, everybody attending. We still have eight, uh, 318 people on the call. Um, I'll be quiet and then the team can answer, take uh, questions, or if you have a question, you know, fire away. All right, um, so the first question, do we need to declare the big five? Um, I believe you're, you're referring to the uh, human allergens. I don't believe it's a requirement on the animal side. It's not necessarily a, a, a bad idea as you know, um, products are in the house and they touch those products. And of course you can have a potential uh, allergic reaction. 
Um, so it's not necessarily a bad idea, but I don't believe there's in the team and, and Bill can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe there is any requirement to declare the big five allergens. Uh, next question, if a skin and coat supplement versus a multivitamin, do we have to specify that on the front panel or does it all fall under pet food supplement? Looks like Jennifer Gornet is typing an answer. I don't know if she wants to answer that question live. Uh, sure. I was just going to mention um, you may, if you want to be clear and state that this is a skin and coat on the front, I think that's a great idea. Uh, but that's not the requirement. You can just say the species food supplement, and that will be sufficient. Um, but if you wanted to add that additional information, that's fine okay as well. Thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. uh, when are ingredients listed in alphabetical order? That is on health supplements. That is not on food supplements. So on food supplements, it's never listed in alphabetical order. It's typically in descending order by quantity in the ingredient statement, and then it would follow the nutrient profile um, for anything that's guaranteed or now in the pet nutrition facts box. All right, last question. So to confirm these updates to the label would not apply to health supplements. That is correct. Uh, hemp product, yeah, not sure I told you. Let me answer that. Let me answer that question on what I think you're asking, right? Because I've been on, we've been on the tip of the hemp spear for a long time. Hemp is an unapproved ingredient currently for use in animal food, period. That's it. Um, whether how a product is classified depends on the intended use as established by the labeling claims under the law, federal or state law. Federal law, it's under 201G1C or 201F as a food or for a structure function non-nutritional benefit. If you have any questions on that, AFCO has a planned uh, uh, intended use label training program that's coming up ahead of the AFCO meeting in San Antonio in August. And so keep an eye on the AFCO website and you might want to attend that if you want further information on allowable claims and intended use as far as intended benefits and product positioning. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so another question, can you declare low fat or light fat on the, on the label? Um, on a food supplement, I, I'm not entirely sure I know the answer, uh, Jennifer, that, Miriam. Did... That section hasn't changed. Okay. Um, so to be clear today, we were only covering the parts of the pet food regulation that has changed. If we didn't speak about something, it's because there were no edits to that section. So the current information regarding making those claims is consistent with how it was in the past. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, if we have a mix of vitamins and minerals in a blended ingredient, do we have to still separate out the vitamins and minerals into separate sections, or would it still be in descending order by quantity in brackets next to the main ingredient? Um, Jennifer and Marion. Katie, do you want to take that? Oh, or Katie, I'm sorry. I no, that's okay. Um, I don't know 100%, but I suspect that the vitamins need to be broken out and listed as vitamins and the minerals will need to be broken out and listed as minerals. That, that's what I would, I would think the same vitamins yeah. and minerals would need to be separated. Yeah. The allowance only goes so far. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> We did have one. Oh, okay. We have another open. Before we find a wrap up, we had one more that I, we wanted to address that isn't listed in the open. So, okay, kid. Uh, so another question: Is it a new rule that all pet food supplements now be declared as intermittent and supplemental feeding on only? What is the reason for the new call out? We're, so that's uh, not really a new call out. Um but it, it has been added to to this section so jennifer i don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit it's 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 just so, it's placing it in the facts box now 
Right. So that nutrition facts box needs to be consistent. And so for supplements, what's nice is that you have one nutritional accuracy statement and the requirement is it must be included and there's a consistent location because we're, yeah. So it's just for consistency amongst all food, pet food products. Thank you, Jennifer and Miriam. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question, oh, this is just, can you re-upload the slides to the chat for those who join later? Um, Jenny, I don't know if you can if you can do that or not. The slides have been uploaded to the chat. They should be okay. for everyone to download. Okay, thank you. Um, the FDA does not recognize dietary supplements for animals. So is there a contradiction indicating this on the label? Um, you're correct. Dietary supplements does not apply to animals, but this is not a dietary supplement. It is a food supplement, and that is a well-established category for animals. Yeah, let me let me just let me just chime in. So, for anybody on this call, the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act does not apply to animals. Okay, we've discussed that extensively at NASC and all the training programs. Um, dietary supplement is a food supplement, a nutritional supplement, which is covered under PF four in the supplement section. So you should go to the AFCO official publication. You should get that either online or in print and refer to food supplements, nutritional supplements, pet supplements. That's what this webinar was about. So don't confuse Deche with animal nutritional supplements or other similar products that are marketed for human consumption. Thank you, Bill. Uh Another question, is there an option to do a dual column pet nutrition facts to help with label spacing? Yes, and I believe in our new guidance document, we do have an example. So um, some of the listings, you know, get pretty long with the, the nutrients being guaranteed. So um, the intent though would be to list the nutrient with its guarantee. And then if you wanna do the dual label, it just follows that that same format, but beside it. Thank you, Mary. I kind of related just to maybe add on that. Um, we didn't, again, go into great detail, but for those of you who have very small packaging in the regulation that is covered, um, it does let you know how to deal with a smaller package and what's required and, and how to amend for that. So again, we didn't go in that kind of detail today. It was just a high level overview, but if you're interested in learning more about that, that is covered in the regulation. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, it looks One like more. there's, yeah, I'm gonna say there's no more questions. So go ahead, Katie. So this came through, but was answered privately. So it got bumped to answered. Um, if you use an ingredient with a standard of identity, does that mean it's food grade? I guess I can cover this because it was under my section, but if I say something and somebody else wants to jump in also, please feel free. So food grade, technically, I guess, yes, in the sense that those are, you know, standard of identity are, are human foods. However, when it comes to putting that same ingredient into a, a pet product, it's no longer food grade. Um, and you couldn't make a claim to it being food grade unless your entire product um, is manufactured and transported, et cetera, under the food regulations, which are 117 of the CFR. So you you couldn't make a claim about that on your pet product. And just to further underpin that, AFCO has a working group talking about, you know, human grade claims. You should refer to the AFCO official publication. And as Katie said, if you want to say human grade, it's got to be 100% human grade, and you have to be able to substantiate that for every single ingredient. As Katie and it said. Needs, yeah, and it needs one, to apply to the whole product, not just an ingredient. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, there was another question. Does AFCO regulate pet food? AFCO doesn't regulate anything. AFCO recommends regulatory policy that many states adopt, and we hope every state follows their recommendations so we have consistency in the industry, and they work very closely with FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. as well as industry for that matter. Thank you. Well, it looks like we don't have, well, it looks like one actually popped up here. Hold on. <laughs> um, <laughs> last minute questions. 
I believe mm -hmm. this human grade definition requires the product to be made in a human food facility. And the answer is yes. If you make a human grade claim, you have to be able to prove all the way through the chain that it is made in a human grade facility meeting 21 CFR 117. Uh, would you, would this apply to sample packaging not intended for individual sale? Probably a good idea to have the formatting correct, but if it's product not intended for sale, then it wouldn't be subjected to the other registration requirements and things. So if it's a sample that you're going to show at a trade show, but you know, I'd say it'd be a pretty good idea to follow the guidelines. Thank you. Um, how closely do other countries follow AFCO? Not sure I know the answer to that. I think Canada does allow for labels to be uh, compliant with AFCO. I'm not 100% sure with other countries. Um, you should check, check, check yeah, locally. You check locally. Um, I can answer the other difference between pet food okay. supplement and functional <laughs> treat. Be very careful with functional <laughs> treats. Um, functional treats are treats are considered food under the SUIP and AFCO. It's a food term. There's going to be a session at Pet Food Forum, which they're going to have an excellent speaker um, that covers this exact topic. So go to Pet Food Forum and you'll have a uh, a deeper uh, a deeper answer into functional treats. I advise caution with functional treats, or otherwise you may have a adulterated and misbranded food product. Thank you. Uh, if a brand makes a bold claim, what body calls that out and asks the brand to correct it? So that really depends on what the claim is. If you're talking about a disease claim or something along those lines, that could potentially be FDA, uh, which would be in the form of an FDA warning letter. It is possible that if you're making improvement claims or something sort of outside of what would be allowed on food or food supplements, um, the individual states could call you uh, uh, call you out on that and not register your product until you revised it. Um, so it really just kind of depends on the claim and uh, you know whether whether it's at the state level or federal level. Uh, and then and then. <laughs> and then Arnie just noted that uh, um, uh, uh, Europe does not follow AFCO. So thank you. I appreciate that, Arnie. All right. I think that's it for questions. There, there's, there's one last question that I got to jump. But what determines okay. whether it's a health supplement or food supplement? It's a multi-part answer. Primarily, it's the intended use is established by the labeling claims, but also contents and specific terms can also influence that. If you have a food term, one word can make that product of food. So, um, and anyway, the, then there's a digestive aid. Is that considered a health supplement? Depends on the intended uses established by the labeling claims. There's an FDA presentation by Micah Allowance, I think it's still up on the AFCO website, that uh, digestive products, um, probiotics specifically, or direct fed microbials can be regulated as uh, food, drugs, or dietary supplements. So some of these questions are not an easy, straightforward answer. Come to the NASC meeting and we'll answer all of those in much more detail for health supplements. All right. Again, I really appreciate everybody attending, uh, veterinarians, retail, state regulators, as well as our members. If you guys have any questions, um, but please feel free to email us at compliance at nesc.cc. And then again, register. Our annual conference is coming up. Register, and you can register as a member. And then the slides, if you did not get the slides, um, for whatever reason, uh, you can either email us or it will be up on the website. Uh, other than that, have a great day or morning, depending on where you're at. And that kind of concludes the presentation.